Hello there and welcome to another episode of Fully Charged News. Now, today I'm going to start with a story. We've got some great stories lined up. But I'm going to start with a story that really is out there. It is kind of bonkers at the leading, at the cutting edge of what is plausible. Um, uh, but what I think this shows beautifully is the, the general consensus that burning fossil fuels is no longer a good idea is really growing and gaining momentum. And people all around the world are developing technologies that can replace the job that fossil fuels currently do in the world we live in. So a Chinese team has developed a, a form of technology known as a plasma thruster uh, that is capable of working within the Earth's atmosphere, because there already are plasma thrusters that work in deep space, uh, that works within the Earth's atmosphere and uses uh, compressed air and electricity to create what is in effect a jet engine under laboratory conditions. Very important point. So let's start at the beginning. A plasma thruster? Sir, fire up the plasma thruster and let's junior birdman the hell out of here! Well, this isn't quite as far-fetched as it might sound, even though I just want a pair of plasma thruster pants just to go flying around in. It would be brilliant, wouldn't it? But no, this is a little bit more plausible than that. They've basically created a jet engine that doesn't burn fuel. Now, it was conceived and built by a team at the Technical Services Institute of Wuhan University. I reckon if I'd done this story six months ago, none of us would have heard of Wuhan, but we have now. It only uses air and electricity. So it compresses the air, it ionizes the air, which increases the temperature, and then it blasts it through a tube. And as it's going through a tube, it's hit by an incredibly powerful microwave, which heats the plasma to unbelievable temperatures and causes an enormous amount of thrust. And at the moment, this is blowing along a little tube that's about the size of a pen, a little that narrow tube. So it's obviously not a massive jet engine yet, but what they've proved is it is possible. They can create enormous amounts of expanding gas and heat which is all that a jet engine does, without burning any fuel. Now, it's way too early to tell if this could be a genuine replacement for the massive jet engines we have on uh, airliners today. But it is, uh, it's not... I think what it says is it's not totally impossible. I mean, I just want to be in the cockpit when they first open up. Fire up the plasma thrusters! Are you sure, sir? It does mean changing the bulb. Sorry, sorry, crossed wires there. Forget that, I didn't say that. And this is a really important part of the argument. You know, modern technological advances, they're not necessarily green. Because green is really used as a term of abuse and a, and a, 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 a stick to beat sustainable, renewable, potentially circular economy technologies. It's not really green, it's not green. I tell you what's green, a bush, grass, that's green. But we can develop technology that is more sustainable, that is more long lasting, that has a less gross and brutal impact on the very small planet we live on. Now, just before the lockdown, I had booked a train uh, to go to the uh, just south of Barcelona in Spain to test drive the new Lexus UX 300E electric car. It was all booked. It was all going to be glorious. We're going to go down to Spain on the train, get off with all the cameras and fit up the car and go for a drive. And blah, blah, blah. No, forget it. So I'm really looking forward to driving this car and eventually there'll be a press one available in the UK and we'll take it out for a test drive and that's fine. I'm happy with that. But what caught my eye recently was a, a very recent press announcement from Lexus about this car. Now, this car has an air-cooled 54 kilowatt hour battery. So nothing spectacular in size, but nonetheless, very, very adequate. But what is really extraordinary is Lexus have just announced that they are uh, that when you buy this car, you will get a 10-year, 1 million kilometer warranty on the battery. Now that is 621,000 miles for us oldies, or people in America that still use miles, uh, but everyone else uses kilometers. Anyway, million kilometers, 621,000 miles, unbelievable amount of distance no big commercial company is going to put a warranty on a product that they haven't got any faith in now some of you may have noticed that when i first talked about this i mentioned that it was the battery was air cooled which it is uh which is the same as the the leaf battery and there has been a lot of dispute about whether an air cooled battery is is worse uh, particularly in the Nissan Leaf, it's a passive air cooling system, which I had to understand what that means. That means it doesn't do anything. If you drive along the road and wind goes past it, that's doing some cooling. 
There's nothing, there's nothing. Whereas the Lexus is air-cooled, but it's got some fans and some heaters. So the batteries can be heated up and they can be cooled down up to a certain extent. All other vehicles have uh, liquid-cooled batteries, water-cooled batteries, which obviously adds an enormous amount of weight and complexity to the system that operates it. But it does seem to mean that the batteries last a bit longer. But Lexus are saying this is very, very stable technology. They're not worried about the batteries losing capacity. They, they are putting this one, one million kilometre warranty on them, which is extraordinary. I think it's also quite interesting that, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't imagine a, a car manufacturer putting a one million kilometre warranty on a, an internal combustion engine or a gearbox or a clutch. They're not going to do it, are they? Let's be honest. Anyway, here's a bit of news about what extremely rich people are doing. Now, John D. Rockefeller, as some of you may know, was the founder of the Standard Oil Company in the United States 150 years ago. Now, his grandchildren now run the 1.1 billion uh, uh, Rockefeller Brothers Investment Fund. It's just, they just invest in things. And five years ago, they divested 100% from fossil fuels. In the following five years, that fund behaved better and made more money than if they hadn't uh, withdrawn from fossil fuels. They admit openly and publicly and have said they did it for ethical and moral reasons, even though the money originally came from oil. You know, John D. Rockefeller was, was the original sort of Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or, you know, all those people who are just ridiculously rich and who we hear so much about. Billionaires, this, billionaire. I'm not interested. So when really stinking rich people who've inherited that wealth, they haven't earned it themselves, they've inherited it, but then use it quite responsibly to change things, I'm prepared to give them a little bit, a tiny smidgen of the benefit of the doubt. I just think it's an interesting story. And clearly, other investment people have noticed this and gone, oh, right, so should we get out of fossil fuels? Big universities, Oxford University recently withdrew all their... They, all these big institutions have massive investments all over the world. Well, they've withdrawn all of them. Oxford University withdrawn all their money out of fossil fuels, finally, in 2020. I mean, they should have done it in about 1967, but they did do it eventually. OK, so car sales around the world. What have they done in the last two months? It's very simple. You don't have to do any percentages or clever, uh, you know, uh, graphs or anything. You just go, it's stopped, totally stopped. No one's buying cars. No one is buying cars. Like in April, no one bought cars, except for people who bought cars from Tesla. So uh, April, has done, they've done extremely well. Uh, Tesla have supplied over 600 cars to people in the UK. Uh, other companies either sold none, literally none, or one or two cars. The next best selling was, interestingly, the Jaguar I-Pace. The two top selling vehicles in this country at the moment are electric cars. Now, why is one of the reasons that's possible is that if you order a Tesla on, you can do all, all of it on your phone. You order the car on your phone, they deliver it to a pre-arranged location. The person leaves the car there, it locks itself when, you, when, it, when he walks away, she walks away. Uh, you go up to it with your phone, your phone opens the car and the car becomes yours. So there's no interaction. You don't even have to see anyone. You can, in fact, take possession of a, a Tesla and never have any direct interaction with another human being. So it's, you know, it's C19 perfect. But there is a far more interesting fact that's just emerged about electric cars and obviously Tesla in particular in the last couple of months. And that is to do with the technology and the potential sustainability and the circular econ economic nature of the technology. These are really important things. So when we get back to normal, you're just a regular person. You go into a showroom and you buy a car, brand new car, BMW 3 Series. Let's say that's what it is. You buy a, a BMW 3 Series, it's about £32,000. You drive it off the lot, badoom, job done. Or you're an ultra-rich elitist scumbag who just wants a virtue signalling plaything. So you go, you order a Tesla and that costs you £38,000. It's a little bit more expensive and it gets delivered and you just get in it and you drive it or virtue signalling all over the place. And here's the massive, massive, brutal problem for those idiots who spent £38,000. And we could lease it, of course. You don't have to buy it outright. But anyway, £38,000 buying this virtue signalling car it isn't even any good it's rubbish uh what happens to it after a year it's lost five percent of its value five percent in one year 
boom, off a cliff. I mean, it's just, you might as well just throw the car away. Well, let's go and have a look at the person who bought the BMW 3 Series, a proper, down-to-earth realist who knows that all this silly hype about electric vehicles, a load of old waffle and renewables don't really work and windmills just kill birds and solar panels just, they're all rubbish and they're made out of really rare materials that have to be dug up by... Puppies, you know, that, what about those sensible people? They bought this car, £32,000. How much is that devalued in the first year? Yeah, let's see about that then. Yeah. Oh, according to the latest statistics, it loses 38.2% of its value in one year. This is a car with an internal combustion engine. This is a beautifully made piece of German engineering. I had to do some maths to work it out. It's £12,224. UK pounds it loses in one year. That's enough to buy another car. That is appalling. And here's the reason why no one wants to buy a second-hand combustion car anymore. Everyone wants to buy a second-hand electric car. That is what is keeping the value of electric cars so high. They are looking at electric cars and going, that is a better piece of technology than the throbbing piece of gristle I've got now with a diesel engine. No, people are sick of that. They know what comes out of the exhaust pipe. They know how clean the air is at the moment while very few people are driving. It's much better. We want to get rid of that technology. So I've been trying not to do ranting and I've, a couple of rants have leaked in. But you know, we've all been shut up for a long time. It's, a, it's inevitably going to happen a little bit. Uh, before I go, uh, I just want to do a lovely thanks to some uh, truly amazing people that are supporting this this show and this channel. It is incredible what they're doing. So the, the Patreon supporters who who donate ten dollars a month or more, which is it's just amazing. There are a hell of a lot of them. I'm going to read out some names now. I really hope if you do support it, your name is in this list. Uh, we will get. I'm going to get through all the names. It's just, just this is going to take some time. Really want to thank Mackenzie Tulip. Chris and Debbie Timco, Ted, Lisa, Cole and Coda, Gareth M. Suds, Duncan Ferguson, Timothy James, Xavier Walker, David Kelshall, Steve Weald, Michael Schaefer, Andreas Mulhout, Richard Lines, Diana Bailey, John Bullington, Steve Clark, Gary McCann, Michael Upston. Thank you, Michael. I actually know Michael. Really pleased. Thank you very much. Mario Rossi. M. Parker Rossi and Brock Winberg. Thank you so much for your support. It is hugely appreciated. It is definitely <laughs> the only thing keeping this channel going at the moment. We've got some brilliant stuff lined up. I know it's just often me in my studio waffling on like an old trout, but believe me, we're, we're this close to getting some really exciting stuff. There's some really good shows coming very soon, coming your way. Uh, a little bit more expansive than the ones we've, we've been able to do for the last few weeks. Um, please do, you know, subscribe to this channel and click the little bell at the top so that you get reminded when new episodes come out because there's a lot more to come. Uh, if you want to look at the Patreon page, I leave that entirely up to you. You can also have a look at the memberships. It's above here or below here. It's on the web, oh, it's on the YouTube webby page, web clickety-click thing. YouTube memberships, interesting. Uh, and that's it, as always. If you have been, thank you for watching.